right, here's the deal. I'm gonna speak to you tonight more as your older brother um, than I would as your pastor, all right? Make sense? Uh, a couple of years ago, we unpacked the Song of Solomon. Anybody here two years ago? An obscure, erotic, ancient Jewish love poem talking about everything, love, romance, sexuality, divorce, uh, arranged marriage, courting, I mean, everything from the scriptures. And, and we discover what God has to say about love and dating and, ro not dating, but romance and sexuality and marriage because the reality is God speaks to our everyday life. One of my great passions as a man of God and as a teacher is to bring the gospel and bring the scriptures out of church language and high crazy theology and into day-to-day -day life when you wake up and you go to Starbucks at dark 30 in the morning. When you show up for math, stupid 65. I mean, you start in math 60 and then math 65 and then stupid 95 and you hate. Where is Jesus in math 65? Where is Jesus when you are, man, what is going on with my life and why this and why that? And one of my great passions is to bring the scriptures, which are relevant, into every day life. Now, the reality is God speaks throughout the scriptures about love and romance. Now, not dating. This is not a series on dating, okay? Dating is a modern cultural phenomenon, all right? If you want to go biblical, let's go arranged marriage, all right? <laughs> now, keep in mind, some things are um, non-biblical, unbiblical, contrary to the heart of God. Other things are simply extra-biblical, Dating is extra biblical, okay? It's not contrary to the heart of God per se, but it's not in the Bible. Some things also in the Bible are um, prescriptive, meaning God saying, this is my way. Other things are simply descriptive. Now, arranged marriage, I would argue from the Bible is descriptive, okay? For those of you wishing, please, why? Um, no, it's, pre it's descriptive, not prescriptive. But the Bible says nothing about dating. I have my opinion, you have your opinion, doesn't matter. I think a dude should take a girl out to dinner, you think a dude should take a girl out to coffee. Doesn't matter, opinion, not a biblical issue, not a moral issue, I'm right, but who cares? <laughs> um, you know, but not, on, on a dead serious note, not a biblical issue. Now, I understand dating is a polarizing issue. And whenever I talk about whatever, Matt Norman's single, half of you love me and the other half of you are like, you idiot, eh, right? <laughs> Who cares if I'm 39 and single? I'm a dude, whatever, right? What's wrong with, all right? I know some of you love me, some of you hate me. Devil Messiah, devil Messiah, whatever, all right? <laughs> I love you guys, which is why I would argue I'm speaking as your older brother, as your friend, um, not so much as some authoritarian figure on love. I'm not Dr. Phil with a Bible, all right? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm your older brother and I love you to pieces. I love you guys from the bottom of my heart to pieces, but um, whatever you think about culture, dating, society, our generation, the climate, the culture of romance, dating here in our community, the way, whatever you think, okay, whether you agree, disagree, whatever, doesn't matter, whatever you think, um, I don't know about you, but when I look at us as a community, when I look at us as a body of people and how we interact as men and women, boys and girls, um, on a romantic level, on a pre-marriage level, I, I look at us and I think something's not quite right. Um, something's a bit out of order, something's a bit dysfunctional. Um, maybe you agree, maybe you don't, um, but myself and the leadership of the church love you guys and look at us as people and say, wait a minute, some, something's upside down. Um, something's not quite right in the way men are interacting with women and women are interacting with men and what about this and what about that? Hmm, something's not quite right. Now, why? Matthew, Matthew chapter 19. Skip down to verse three. We read, um, the Pharisees also came to him, Jesus, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Okay, stupid question, right? But in ancient Jewish culture, like today, divorce was rampant in, in Israel, in Jesus' day. And culture was confused and um, people's understanding of love and romance and sexuality 
even in Israel, was upside down like today. Why? What is wrong with us? What is wrong with humanity in our society? Let's keep reading. Verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, have you not read, being sarcastic, by the way, speaking with Pharisees, men who study the Hebrew scriptures for a living, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning, and he's quoting Genesis right here, made them male and female? Here's why you guys are upside down and you don't understand and divorce. And here's why Jesus says you don't understand. From the beginning, God made humanity male and female. Now, we don't have a time tonight for a long study on gender roles from the scriptures, okay? Those of you new to the Bible, um, new to the Jesus deal, I'm going to sound super weird for the next hour. Um, this is a family conversation. Listen and pay attention, and I think we are going to unpack gender roles in June, God willing. But for us right now, long story short, here's what the Bible says. Men and women are equal in every way. Equal value, equal worth, equal role in humanity, culture, society, the church, marriage. But men and women are different. Now, some of you are thinking, duh, hello. But we live in a culture trying to make men into women, trying to chickify dudes. And I'm... <laughs> Dead serious. I am one, I'm not joking. I am 100% dead serious. We live in a culture trying to turn men into women and trying to turn women into men, right? Now, women don't want to marry a dude who can borrow their clothes, right? And men don't want to marry a girl who can beat him up, all right? Simple, simple science. But we live in an upside down culture and we stand for a better way. We stand for a kingdom for a community, for a society of heaven on earth where men are free to act like men and where women are free to act like women. Equal but different. Everybody say equal but different. Equal but different. Exactly. Now, mantra, equal but, wait, where's the punch, right? Equal but different. Now, the point, cult joke, punch, you're repeating after me? Anyway, okay. The point, the point is, here's the problem. Our culture's understanding of masculinity, I would argue, is upside down. Uh, Joe Monaco, thank you for this. But in the Portland Business Journal last week, article entitled, and I quote, Portland, Oregon, near the bottom of the US's manliest cities. <laughs> true story. I know, I know, true story right out of a national study, okay? Um, and I know we are kind of artsy, but I play guitar. What's wrong with me? Right, yeah. But okay, here we go. Let's read. <laughs> Portland ranks near the bottom of a ranking of the country's 50 manliest cities. According to a study by Sperling's Best Places, Nashville, Tennessee is America's most manly city. Now, <laughs> here we have, listen, dead serious. It's not a joke. It's a real story. Um, this is how our culture in the, sto in the study defined masculinity. Here we go. In the rankings, cities scored higher on masculinity based on the number of sports teams they have, the number of hardware stores, the number of tools purchased, and the frequency of monster truck rallies. <laughs> okay? Now, here is how the study defined femininity, all right? Cities lost points... Portland, based on their number of home furnishing stores, high minivan sales, amen, and subscription rates to beauty magazines. Now, New York ranked at the bottom of the list based on low scores, including a lack of fishing and drag racing opportunities. Bummer. And Portland is ranked number 47. Um, if our culture's understanding of what a man looks like is Home Depot and monster truck rallies, um, I would argue something's not right. Whatever happened to the biblical model of masculinity, to men like David, who was a warrior and a poet, who could kill Goliath and write his baby a poem? I mean, what, whatever, I'm dead, whatever happened to the warrior, poet model of biblical masculinity, whatever happened to, in the language of 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to read later on, a meek, and quiet spirit, a biblical picture of femininity. Now, I would argue we as a society, speaking of the world out there, and I think somewhat of us as a community right here, 
Why are we confused? Why is our understanding of romance and love and marriage and sexuality dysfunctional? I think at best, I would argue, because we don't understand men and women are different and don't grasp what a godly man looks like, what a godly woman looks like. Now, um, most of the time when we talk about love, dating, romance, courting, I mean, you can kiss dating goodbye, you can hug courting hello, whatever you desire. Um, <laughs> But when we talk about romance, most of the language, most of the talk is about finding your spouse. Am I right? Um, finding my wife, finding my P31, finding my hot and holy, finding my whatever, okay? Um, but I would argue the talk should not be so much about finding your spouse, about finding the right person, but rather our talk, our conversation, our study from the scriptures should be about being the right person? Are we tracking? Our focus is on, as guys, finding the right woman, as girls, waiting for the right guy. I, I would argue our focus should be on being the right person. And when we become a man of God with our masculinity defined not by our annual income or monster car truck rallies, but rather by a warrior poet model of biblical true as a gentle giant biblical masculinity. When we as women, or you as women, not me, but you as women, <laughs> um, discover who you are in Christ, not in the world, not in society, not compared to Hollywood, not compared to cosmopolitan, but who you are in Christ, I would argue what is right now upside down is turn right side up and God is able to move and work. Now, next week we're gonna talk, I'm not gonna talk a ton about dating, but next week we're gonna talk about what a healthy, the marks of a healthy relationship, whether you are dating, courting, from India and pledged to be married to somebody you don't know, whatever, um, which is not as bad as it sounds um, if you're a dad. Um, but, <laughs> I am. Um, but wherever you are from, whatever your point of view, we're gonna talk about the marks of a healthy relationship next week. But tonight, right now, let's talk about the marks of a godly man, the marks of a godly woman. What is a godly woman who is Christ-like, whose femininity is defined by the scriptures in God's heart, not the world, um, who's ready for marriage, what does she look like? And what is a godly man who's masculine, but not in the world sense of beer and NASCAR, but in, <laughs> in God's sense, you can be intelligent and buff at the same time. Did you know? All right. In God's sense, what is a godly man who's ready for marriage, ready to step, because marriage is for men, not boys, who's ready to step into leadership and into marriage. What, it, what does he look like as a man of God? Now let's turn to Genesis um, with me, chapter 24. Let's read the ancient love story of Isaac and Rebekah. I love the story of Isaac and Rebekah. Um, three, 4,000 years old in the scriptures, but I would argue relevant for us, for us today. Now I forewarn you, this is gonna take like forever, all right? Um, Hang in there and don't drink the rest of your coffee. Genesis chapter 24. Ladies first. First we read about um, Rebecca. Then in the next chapter, um, we read about Isaac. Ladies first. Here we go. If you are taking notes, write this down. If you aren't taking notes, repent of your sin and write this down. And um, no, I'm joking. Kind of. Uh, the seven marks of a godly woman. When we read the story, we unpack seven marks of a godly woman who's Christ-like, who's feminine in God's eyes, who's ready for marriage. And yes, I'm a dude teaching on the seven marks of a godly woman. Um, bizarre. Let's go. 24, verse 1. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. He had many, many what? Many sons, yes. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh. Um, okay, more on that later. <laughs> and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. Um, they were living, by the way, long story short, quick background, they were living in the promised land, Canaan, with pagan people far from God. They were from Mesopotamia. His family was from a thousand miles away in modern day Iraq. And Abraham says, okay, my servant, here's your job. Go discover a bride, discover a wife for my son, Isaac, who was, we read later on, pushing 40. The time has come, my friend. 
um, who was pushing 40, go discover wives. Now here's um, what you have to understand. In the ancient Near East, it was the father's job to provide a wife for his son, unlike today. My dad tried, but to no luck. I was like, dad, no. All right, no, my dad tried. But in ancient society, it was the father's job. Now, in our society today, we date, we go online, we check out Facebook, whatever. But here's the, if you're lame, but um, no, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking, I think I'm the one and only dude not on Facebook. Anybody here not on like anti-tech, yeah, three of us, okay. Um, <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you three, yeah, okay. Um, but listen up, pay attention. Today, it's the Father's job with a capital F. God, our Father, our Creator in heaven, it's His job to provide us with a spouse. You men with a woman, you women with a man. Now, that doesn't mean we don't go out looking. Let's read the story. That doesn't mean we don't go out and, and go searching for ours, but it's God's job to provide. Those of you thinking, I'm 21 and I'm married. Dude, relax. Seriously. <laughs> It's okay, all right? It's God's job to provide a spouse. Now, Abraham goes on to say four, but you shall go to my country and to my family, take a wife for my son Isaac. Now, here we go. The first mark of a godly woman, Christ-like, feminine, beautiful, ready for marriage, is she's a part of God's family. I repeat, she's a part of God's family. He says, don't go to the Canaanites. No, no, go back to my family, my house, my people, and pick a bride for my son Isaac from my family. Brothers and sisters, okay, this goes without saying, I know, and some of you are like, yeah, duh, but let's get the cat out of the bag. Um, marry in God's family. Don't play missionary dating, don't go outside. I don't care how old you are, how lonely you are, it's the greatest mistake you could ever, one of you could ever make. Marry inside God's family, and by that I mean a woman who is saved, a man who is saved, a woman who is seeking after God, a man who is seeking after God. Jesus said, everything comes down to this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. The key is to discover somebody who is pursuing after Jesus, not marriage. People who are pursuing after marriage end up, for the most part, single or married and unhappy. People who are pursuing after Jesus, single, married, celibate, 25 kids, God pity you, but whatever, <laughs> end up filled with the Holy Spirit and overflowing with joy. God should be our consuming passion, our everything. Be my what? My everything, and I can't sing that high, but I scream out anyway. Be my every, ah, sorry whoever's sitting next to me, but be, be my Christ in me, the hope of glory. Be my everything. We are looking for men and women, for a spouse who is consumed and inflamed with desire to know the living God. And the first mark of a godly woman, or man for that matter, is a passion to know Jesus. She's a part of God's family. She's a God-fearing woman, and her burning desire is to know God. Let's keep reading. Five, the servant said to him, perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? Okay, if she's not willing to leave her family and her friends and her life back in Mesopotamia, should I bring your son, your son back? What if she's not willing to follow? But Abraham said to him, six, beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family who spoke to me and swore to me saying, to your descendants I will give you this land. Meaning who gave our family a vision, who gave us men a vision and a calling. Every man at some point in his time receives from God a vision for his life, a calling on his life in God's kingdom. He has a vision from God, Isaac has. And every man, I would argue, at some point in time receives a vision from God if he is seeking him. He will send his angel, and by the way, guys, it takes time, and it's okay if it takes time. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. Now notice verse eight. And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. All right, now some of you are gonna get angry with me right now, but here's the deal. The second mark of a godly woman who's ready for marriage, who's Christ-like, is she's willing to follow. She's willing to follow her husband. 
Not off a stupid cliff, not with blind, but she's willing to, she's not brainless, spine, but she is strong, she is courageous, and she is willing to follow her husband on his vision, his calling, his life journey. Interesting, the first text on marriage in the Bible is Genesis chapter two, where we read God um, created Adam by himself and said, here's your job, here's your vision, here's your calling, care for the earth, care for the garden, we talked about a month or two ago. Um, but then God says something I think hilarious. He says, it is not good that man should be alone, um, which in the Hebrew means John Mark seriously needs help. I, dude, I will make him Tammy to spare his soul, right? Um, Brooke seriously needs help. All God's people would argue, yes, amen, I will make him Elizabeth. Evan seriously needs help. Sandy, you are blessed beyond your imagination, Evan, so on. Um, because men need help. I need help. And you're like, I don't, yeah, mm-hmm, mm -hmm, yes. <laughs> men, men, yes, we are dudes, right? But, we, but let's be honest, we need help. And a woman's role is helping her husband with his calling, his vision, or should I say their calling, their vision. I know I sound backward and some of you are angry, but read the Bible. Now, um, I don't mean to sound flippant, but um, here's, here's the deal. If you read the story of Genesis chapter three, or chapter two, you discover that God created Eve from Adam's side, from his side, not, not, not in front of him, leading him, pushing him or dragging him. Come on, dude, come on, grow up. N not behind him. Not he's dragging her, you're my slave, you know, do the laundry, you know, wear a wedding dress, the planes, yeah, 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 hey, I'm hungry, yeah. Um, <laughs> dumb, all right? Um, and, but from his side, I mean, you right at his side, following him, helping him, helping him survive, but right, not in front of him, leading him, not behind him, him dragging her, treating her like a slave, but with respect and with honor, right at his side, walking with him. But a woman's role is to follow her husband. And the mark of a godly woman is one who's ready for, one who is willing to follow her husband and say, you know what, I believe in you. I believe in the calling God has in your life. I believe in the vision you have for your life. I know you're young, I know you're figuring out your life, I know you're not perfect, but I believe in you as a man and I'm willing to follow you. Now, let's keep reading, nine. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Um, awkward, but in the ancient Near East, um, when a man would make a vow, he would place his hand on another man's UI thigh, upper inner thigh, and would vow as a sign of vulnerability and respect and trust. By the way, Brooke, who's my best friend, and I, we have taken up this practice. <laughs> and uh, I'm dead serious. Whenever we vow to each other, um, a couple of weeks ago, we sat down, we made a vow to stay skinny, um, the rest of our life, to not get fat ever, all right? And every day we're like, because seriously, most dudes over the age of whatever are not looking awesome. We're like, um, put bluntly, we're like, dude, we are gonna, we don't have to be great looking, but 50 is gonna roll around, we're gonna stay thin or somewhat thin and, and dress somewhat awesome, okay? And, and so we sit, sat across from each other, I grabbed his upper inner thigh, he grabbed mine, we vowed to each other, it was very awkward. And, uh, and every week we ask each other, did you go running? Yes, did you work out? No, you idiot, I'm sorry, uh, whatever. Okay, now, back to the story. Then, 10, just a thought, you guys with a good friend, just a thought. Then, the servant, <laughs> I'm getting an email on that one. Um, then the servant, quiet down you people. The servant took 10 of his master's camels and departed. For all his master's goods were in his hand, and he arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water at evening time, the time, notice, when women go out to draw water. Ooh. Then, he, where are the women? At the well at nighttime. I'm going to the well. Now, <laughs> then he said, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, man of prayer, please give me success this day. Show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, here I stand by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city, the single women, um, are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink, and she says, drink, and I will give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac, and by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. What's happening? 
What's happening is he, the servant, is looking for a spouse for Isaac. I mean, he's out looking, he's out searching. Now, um, guys, on one hand, and gals, on one hand, it's the father's job to provide a spouse for you. On the other hand, it is written in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, a verse every man should memorize, he who finds a wife finds what? A good thing. A what? a good thing and receives favor from the Lord. You blessed with a wife or a beautiful woman, you are engaged to be married, you are blessed by God, he receives favor from the Lord. Now the word finds is um, maha, I think in the Hebrew, and can be translated, go out and look for something that's lost. Next time you're like, baby, you're lost. <laughs> now you are found, <laughs> all right? You are home. No, I'm joking. Um, uh, but the reality, God, it's God's job to provide a spouse for us, does not mean we sit around waiting for a knock on the door. Men, it's okay to go out looking. Where are the single women who love Jesus? At the well. Let's go to the well right now. You know, I'm thirsty right now. Let's go. Um, it's okay. He's out looking for a spouse. Now, skip down to verse 15. Um, I know that none of you are here looking for a spouse right now. You are pure. Your heart is for Jesus and nothing else. Not you guys. Now, 15. Um, it ha I'm speaking tongue-in-cheek because sometimes people email me and they're like, do you know some people just come to the way to get married? Are you serious? <laughs> no way. I mean, you, not everybody's here just for, are you serious? You're right, they should not go to church to find a spouse. You are dead right. They should go downtown to the bar to find a spouse, not church. I mean, Jesus is in church. You should go somewhere else to find your spouse. Um, I'm, I'm speaking tongue in cheek, but we should find a spouse, find a husband, find a wife from God's family. This should not be a meat market. If you're coming here to get a wife, you're dumb. And I'm gonna do my very best to make you feel incredibly uncomfortable. And you might come for a couple of weeks and think the girls are cute, and if I do my job right, you're gonna hate me in a couple of weeks and leave and go somewhere else where there's nobody speaking about Jesus in the Bible, all right? We are here to seek the face of the living God, but we are family, we're a body of people, and you should find your spouse, your husband, and your wife as you walk through life, whether you're at church or downtown or going to school, wherever you are, as you live, as you walk with God's people in community, God, I believe, should bring Bring you a spouse and you should step out in faith. Now, 15, it ha whatever that looks like for you. And it happened before he had finished speaking that behold, Rebecca, now here we go, she's awesome, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with a pitcher on her shoulder. Ooh, how awesome. Now, 16, the young woman was very beautiful to behold. The third mark of a godly woman is beauty. I repeat, beauty. Now, here's what you have to understand about beauty. We live in a Hellenistic society and a depraved culture. Um, we live in a society where the female body, in particular um, with no clothes on, is worshiped by men and women alike by men in the movie theater, um, online, by women with your Cosmopolitan magazine, and um, by men and women alike, we live in a culture where that naked female body is worshiped, where beauty um, in a shallow, superficial, unrealistic, airbrushed way is worshiped. Now, the danger is, um, I, I watch sometimes people in the church, particularly girls, but people in the church, overreact against our screwed up, depraved, satanic culture and swing to the opposite extreme, thinking beauty is somehow ungodly. Look out the window. God created beauty. Beauty is a gift from God. Vanity is ungodly. There's a difference between beauty and vanity. Are we tracking? Are we? Now, how beauty is defined by the world, the size of your chest, how skinny you are, your complexion, is nothing like how beauty is defined in the eyes of God. First Peter, in fact, turn um, with your finger in Genesis, turn to the right, if you're a girl or a guy, whatever, turn to the right in your Bible to um, First Peter, Chapter, where are we? Um, First Peter chapter, I think three. Just, yeah, just kidding. First Peter chapter three, verse three. 
um, speaking to women, here is um, how beauty is defined by God on his word. Peter in chapter three, um, verse three, says, do not, speaking of women, not men, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold. Um, I know gold is kind of coming back in. Are you convicted? Um, gold <laughs> or putting on fine apparel, right? Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, speaking about Genesis, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, Isaac's mother, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Meaning there's a different kind of beauty, one from the inside out. Um, now, keep in mind, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about holistic salvation. We talked about um, our false kind of church ideology. You are not a spirit stuck in a body. You are an integrated human being created by God. Body, soul, spirit, mind, personality, will, emotion, everything rolled into one and Jesus died to save all of you. Glorification, the theological idea. One day your body is, go you don't get a new body in heaven, you get a renewed body in heaven. You get a glorified, the scripture says, body in heaven. You're simply put, your body is a part of who you are. And taking care of your body is a part of God's calling on your life. We talked about Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Present your what? Your bodies to God as a living sacrifice. Which means men and women alike, we should care for our body. Doesn't matter if you look like Angelina Jolie or not so much. You should care for your body and do the best with what you have. Nothing wrong with beauty, it's a gift from God, but understanding true beauty flows from the inside out. You know, I know women, I know I'm speaking frankly here, but I know women who are not stick thin, who don't look like Angelina Jolie, who don't run 35 miles a day and eat bird food, um, <laughs> but, and who aren't eight feet tall, but who care for their body, do the best with what they have, and they are gorgeous. Uh, and I speak as a brother, their beauty radiates from the inside out. There is a sparkle in their eye. There is something about their presence, the incorruptible beauty, to borrow from Peter's language, of a gentle and quiet spirit. And that kind of beauty, not the one about how tall you are, how fit you are, or whatever, that kind of beauty is precious in the eyes of God and is the mark of a godly woman. Now, back to the story, back to Rebecca, Genesis 24. Her beauty flowed from her purity. Next we read, uh, 16, now the young woman was very beautiful to behold, a virgin. No man had known her. She was pure. She was a virgin. This fourth mark of a godly woman is purity. Now, here's the deal. When we talk about purity in the church, for the most part, we talk about purity from a male perspective because the majority of the teaching is coming from dudes. I don't understand you chicks. You are confusing. Married for seven years. I don't understand you. You're awesome, but I don't understand you. And the majority of teaching about purity and sin in general comes from male perspective, which I'm learning is somewhat dangerous because from the pulpit, we harp on male sins, greed, pornography, violence, anger, but we don't talk for the most part a lot about more female specific sins. Are we tracking? Now, purity is a male and a female issue, different, but an issue for both men and women. You know, I was on a date with my wife last night, whom I love to pieces. She's gorgeous and awesome. And if you know my wife, she's about the most magnanimous, kind person on the, not a mean bone in her body, right? But yesterday she said something kind of cutting. And whenever my wife says anything, like even close to not super gentle, I'm like, whoa, what is going on over here? <laughs> and she was talking about the last five years, we were praying for you guys. We drove to Seattle for dinner and something crazy last night, weird last minute date. Anyway, um, I'm young, let's go to Seattle, whatever. It's four in the afternoon, let's go to Seattle for dinner. All right, let's go. Um, anyway, I'm really tired today. Um, 
But uh, we're driving and we were talking about tonight. I was running everything I'm saying by her and getting her feedback and getting her woman's perspective. And she was saying, no, don't, don't say that, honey. Don't, uh-uh. Uh, that good, don't say that. And so on and so forth. This is the filtered version. Can you believe? Anyway. Um, <laughs> And uh, we were praying for you guys. We, I mean, we love you guys. And we were praying for, I don't know, I think an hour, babe, or something like that, for you guys on the way home, driving home late. And she said something interesting. She said, after five years of praying with gals in the counseling room, she said, you know what? I am sick and tired of women not taking responsibility for their sin. She said, I'm sick and tired of women blaming losing their virginity or having sex with their boyfriend on their boyfriend and not owning up and taking responsibility for their own sin. And like we talked about two weeks ago, healing begins with what? With repentance. It takes two to tango. Theological truth. And we can blame our boyfriend or our girlfriend for seducing us or our boyfriend for being whatever. I'm not talking about rape. I'm not talking about abuse. But we need to own up. We need to take responsibility. Women need to take responsibility for their sin for their immodest clothing leading to whatever situation. Now, purity is an issue for men and women. We need brothers and sisters to guard our minds. And we talk all the time about men, don't look at pornography, don't be stupid, don't want what we harp on men, which is great because we men need help and we need to be challenged to walk with Christ and and get impurity and sexual immorality out of our life and out of our mind. Throw away your laptop, it's not worth it. Throw away your computer, whatever. Change your life now, tonight. Repent of your sin, go to your prayer room and stop screwing around pornography. But that said, um, what pornography is to a man's mind Chick flicks, romance novels, and fantasy can be to a woman's mind. I mean, we live in a crazy culture. Now, because of pornography, men view women with an unrealistic idea of what a woman should look like. Would you agree? An airbrushed, not real, bird food, 30 miles a day, and Photoshop, unrealistic view. It's not what a woman looks like. It's not what a real woman looks like. But women, on the other hand, because of chick flicks, I'm not saying Tom Hanks is satanic, but because of fantasy and shit, I like Sleepless in Seattle, to be honest. I'm kind of an action movie kind of guy, but Sleepless, great movie, what can I say? Um, Because of chick flicks and romance novels and fantasy, women view men, now listen, with an unrealistic expectation of what men should act like. Men, unrealistic, what women should look like. They don't look like that in real life. Women, unrealistic idea of what men should act like. Your boyfriend is not Matthew McConaughey. And to be honest, guys think he's annoying, to be honest. I know girls like him, but in real, right? Am I right? I mean, I think he is, I mean, he's buff, but he's annoying, right? Um, God bless him, save his soul. But um, in, seriously, tune in. In real life, Brad Pitt cheated on his wife. In real life, um, Hugh, whatever his face, the awesome British dude, was arrested for having sex with a prostitute in the back of his car on the side of the road. Um, Meg Ryan, let's go talk to Hanks and Meg Ryan. She was married to one of the best looking guys in America, and she's divorced. Kate Hudson, uh, she was married to a freaking rock star, divorced. It's a lie. Hollywood is a lie. Your chick flick night, with you, it's a lie. It's fantasy, it's not true. I'm not saying watching some cheesy movie is satanic. I'm simply saying, don't buy into the lie of an unrealistic expectation of what a man is. Your man might not look like Matthew McConaughey. He might not buy you 25 roses every single day, but you know what? He might be faithful to you, and he might love you, and he might hang out with you when you don't look like Meg Ryan, and he might love you till death do us part. He might be a normal dude, He might work for Napa Auto Parts, come home, nothing wrong with Napa Auto Parts, come home every day at 5.05 and hang out and relax, but but he's a man. And you should love him and respect him and thank God for him. Purity, men and women, guard your minds. Back to the story. Uh, Verse 18, half of you are hating me right now. 17, and the servant ran to meet her. Like, who is this woman? And he said, Please let me, oh, wait a minute. My wife said, make sure you say it. Wait a minute, 16. She was a virgin. I know we come from an immoral, screwed up generation. 
And I know some of you right now are grieving and, um, and are thinking, man, I blew it a year ago, five years ago, two years ago. Now I'm walking with God, but my past is, is a wreck. Listen, it is written. If any man or woman be in Christ, he is a new what? Creation. Old things have passed away. What happened with him or passed away, it's done. It's over. It's gone. Behold, it is written, all things have become what? New. You are a new creation. Live with your life defined not by your past, but by your future. Not by who you were, but by who you are becoming. And walk with Christ every day as a clean slate. Now, 17. Uh, the servant said, please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. You are awesome. Now she said, 18, drink my Lord. Then she went um, she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand, gave him a drink, and when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. Then she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough, uh, trough, ran back to the well. She's running. I mean, she's no prissy chick. She's like working hard, watering camels, hoo, hoo, running. I mean, she's awesome. She, she's got hustle, dude. She ran back to the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. Not one. She's not like, oh, let me water your camels. She's like, all of your camels. I mean, what kind of girl waters camels? She's awesome. And the man, look at, wondering at her. It's like, is she for real? Who is this woman? Remain silent so as to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. He's like, who is she? What's going on? Is she for real? Now, the fifth mark of a godly woman is a servant's heart. I repeat, and some of these could be true for men and women, but in particular, and from the story, from Rebecca's life, a servant's heart. She's a helper. She's serving him. She's helping him. Now, girls, let me let you in on a little secret. Godly guys love, and I mean, I mean love women with a servant's heart. True story. And a lot of girls don't understand this. In fact, one of the things that first attracted to me to my beautiful bride, now Tammy, um, was her servant's heart. I was playing in a band with her older brother, and we would go to his house and practice in their basement, and, and she, the entire time, would serve us and make us cough, and now I understand what was going on, but I thought she was just nice. <laughs> um, she, would, she would serve us, and do you want some coffee, John Mark? Yes, with cream, yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, black. I'm a man, black. Uh, and see, are you hungry? She would make us food. I remember whenever she was cooking, she would sing. I was like, a singing cook. <laughs> you know, oh, yes, this is the one right here. Um, you know what I think I think's fascinating? Okay, every week, um, we pour uh, about 1,500 cups of, of juice for communion and bread, and um, make about enough for a thousand people to have a cup of coffee. About a thousand of you grab a cup of coffee, hopefully in your mug now after our announcement, but if not, whatever. Um, now, the majority of the people who, that doesn't show up. People spend hours pouring grape juice in cup, and making you coffee for a thousand cups of coffee. And the vast majority of the people who show up a couple of hours early and work hard are women. Not all, but the vast majority. Now, here's what I think is hilarious, because I kind of get my vent point of you guys from here. I watch every Friday night. It's going to sound kind of mean, but I don't mean it mean. Um, I watch girls in here flirting with guys. No, nothing wrong. I have no problem with girls flirting with guys. All right. Not me. I'm married, but you. Um, uh, but I have no problem. Great. I mean, whatever. All right. But I, I look out in the foyer, okay? And I watch these girls like hardcore going back and forth from the kitchen over there to the coffee over there, like with their little carts, you know, like pouring, come in, come in, come in, coffee, coffee, coffee. And what is bizarre, those girls are all getting married. I keep losing every single one of my coffee and communion leaders. They keep getting stinking married. Laura back there married a guy doing sound tonight, Ryan, and I mean, Katie, I married off last weekend to Jeremy. It's like, what's going on? I keep losing my leaders. So if you want to get married, go serve. In the, no, I'm joking. Um, but what I, think is sing, what I think is hilarious, the women flirting with the guys, not so much luck. The girls out serving, the guys are like, dude, could you pour me French vanilla in my coffee, please? And what's your name? Uh, guys are drawn. Uh, you can agree or disagree, but guys, am, am I right, guys? We are drawn when, when a woman, <laughs> when a woman has a servant's heart. I mean, something we melt. Our heart is like we are like just little kids. We're like, oh yes, right? 
or our hearts melt. Now, here's, what, here's what's important. Singleness, now tune in. I, this is going to be a long teaching, gosh. Singleness um, is, uh, is, is training for being selfish, to be honest. Those of you who make a list of what you are looking for in a spouse, that is the dumbest thing you could ever do. You are, I'm dead serious. You are writing a list for a human slave, not a spouse, okay? I had no list. I, I said, love Jesus and hot. Two requirements. Uh, uh, other than that, I can kind of work with personality, hair color, you know what I mean? The guys who are like blonde hair, shoulder length, blue eyes, work here. I'm like, dude, you are like, oh my gosh, never gonna happen, right? You are creating a job description for a slave. The people with the best marriages or relationships before marriage are two givers, two servants serving each other. People um, with divorce are two takers taking from each other. And people with an unhealthy relationship are a giver and a taker. One person giving, the other person taking. Give, 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 take, take, take. Unhealthy relationship leading to divorce. Good marriages and good healthy relationships are about two givers, two servants, male and female, pouring into each other. It's the mark of a godly man and, in particular, of a godly woman. Now, back to the story. Uh, so it was, 22, when the camels had finished drinking and the man took a golden nose ring, she was indie rock, nose ring, everything. Um, weighing half a shekel, two bracelets for her wrist, weighing 10 shekels of gold, and said, whose daughter are you? Tell me, please, is there room in your father's house to lodge? Now, we don't have time to read the entire story. She goes back, says, mom, dad, can I marry this dude, Isaac? Mom, dad, brother Laban are like, yes, awesome. And she goes off. Now, skip down to verse 59. Let's, let's get back to work. So they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. Now notice 60. They blessed Rebecca and said to her, Our sister, may you become the what? The mother of thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Notice their blessing, their prayer for their little sister and their daughter was not, may you look hot at 63, or not, may you drive a Range Rover. Their prayer was may you thrive as a mother. The sixth mark of a godly woman is a desire to become a mother. Later on we read, in the, which is not a male desire, all right, um, <laughs> obvious, a female desire. Later on we read in Paul's letter to Timothy, she, speaking of women in general, women humanity, shall be saved in childbearing. Meaning, woman, meaning when a woman, when a woman gives birth to a child, some part of her comes alive. Some part of her is awakened by the Spirit of God and how God designed her and fabricated her. Some part of her comes alive. Now, men, keep in mind, you are not simply looking for a wife, you are looking for a mother. Your wife, whoever you marry, how many of you dudes wanna have children at some point in time? Most dudes wanna have kids, not all, but most. Um, girls are like, oh, yes. Guys are like, yep, yep, right there. Right, right. <laughs> um, your wife is going to influence your children more than anybody else on the face of the planet. Your children will reflect her character more than anything. And I'm not saying it's wrong to be single and wrong to not ever have kids. I'm simply saying the majority of you are at some point going to get married. And guys, you want a woman who is not resistant. And gals, if you want to become a godly woman, don't resist God's calling in your life. Embrace it. One of the things that made me fall head over heels in love with my wife, Tammy, right when I met her, was I remember asking her, what do you want to do with your life, right? And, and instead of the typical career response, nothing wrong with the crew, great, awesome. I would have no problem with that. But I remember, I remember to this day, her response was, I want to become a mother and raise sons and daughters to love Jesus. No, she was not ashamed, she was proud, she was courageous. She understands that that is not popular in our culture, that people look down on you for having that perspective on marriage and family. And with confidence, she said, I wanna become a mother. To which I responded, I? want to become a father, or are you, you're hot, and you want to become a, I'm in the market, let's go, all right. Um, no, I'm joking, but we live in a culture looking down on women for, for becoming mothers and no more, with this bunch of baloney. And we stand from the scriptures for a better way. I think it takes more brains, 
more education, more intelligence, more personality, more leadership ability, more godliness, more passion, more physical energy. Uh, it's a mother. I know my wife's job raising our two boys is way harder than my job leading you guys. Hands down, no questions asked. She's working her tail off. I'm hanging out in Seattle, right? It is a hard job, and I have more respect for my wife than any other woman on the face of the planet. I thank God for my wife every day, not simply because she's a great wife, but because she's a great mother. And she is raising my two boys, Jude and Moses, whom I love more than anything, to fear God and walk in his ways. Now, anyway, we've got to keep going. Back to the story, 61. Then Rebecca and her maids arose. Every girl has her posse, guys. It's a part of life. I know you guys are like, what is it with women and like little Estro Castle circle, like <laughs> impenetrable. I'm trying to ask a girl out, she's never alone, all right? Okay, guys, it's part of life. Song of Solomon, 3,000 year old love poem. We read about the daughters of Jerusalem who are her annoying friends who are like budding into the relationship. Oh yeah, you sing this one, we sing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, shut up, leave me alone with my woman. <laughs> and the woman's like, but my friends, the Shulamite's friends with daughters of Jerusalem. It's, it's ancient, every culture, every die, every woman has her posse. But girls, make yourself available, all right? I mean, once in a while, break out of your crazy, impenetrable, you know, circle of death, whatever. <laughs> break up. And guys, isolate her, draw her away, and pick her off. All right? Now, <laughs> back to the story. <sighs> I know it's scary, but you're dudes. I believe in you. All right. Um, or, or don't. Whatever. Um, so her maids arose, and they rode on the camels. Maybe that's culture, not Bible, I don't know. Um, they rode on the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. Now, Isaac came from the way of Beer Lahai Roy. Not Beer, but Beer Lahai Roy, all right? For he dwelt in the south. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. He lifted his eyes and looked, and there the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel, for she had said to the servant, who is this man walking to meet us? Who is this hunk of burning love? The, the servant said, in the Hebrew, the servant said, it is my master. So notice what happens. Last thing, here we go before men. She took a veil and covered herself. Oh, it's, it's, oh, it's him. Oh, it's, she took a veil. She, she covered herself, a sign in the ancient Near East of modesty and purity. The last but not least mark of a godly woman is modesty. Let me read to you from um, Paul's letter to Timothy, chapter two. He says in verse nine, in like manner also let the women, you girls, adorn themselves. The word adorn is cosmeo in the Greek, where we get the modern word cosmetology. Let them adorn themselves in modest apparel. What kind of apparel? Modest apparel. With propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing but which is proper for women professing godliness with, with good works. He's not saying makeup is a sin. Okay, don't misunderstand what he's saying. He's saying you should be known not by how much money you spend at Forever 21 or Nordstrom, but by good works and a beauty flowing from the inside of your soul out. But he says, let your dress be with modest pair. I'm shocked by our culture, I mean, by what women wear in our culture, but... To be honest, I speak and love as an older brother. I'm shocked by what some of you gals wear here to church. You know, um, guys, godly guys ask me on a regular basis, not joking, John Mark, would you please say something to our sisters at church? Would you please ask them to dress more modestly? I'm like, sure, you want me to stand up and be like, chicks, put on more clothes. I'm like, thank you. But I get asked on a, re I'm dead serious, on a regular basis by men who love Jesus. Man, we are fighting for purity. We are working hard. Will you please? It's distracting. I'm coming here not to get a wife, to love Jesus. Not to get a wife, awesome, but to love Jesus. And it's distracting and it's hard. And, and some women are immodest because they want men's attention. Anathema, watch out, guys. Because if she wants men's attention, you can marry her, you can love her, you can buy her flowers, but she doesn't want a man's attention. She wants men's attention. And that's not going to go away. Watch out. 
But most women, um, I think around here, simply are naive and don't understand. We men, we are physical, visual creatures. We respond. We don't have to know your name. We don't have to know who you are. We don't have to read a book. We don't have to have an eight-hour coffee with you. We're like, oh, uh, we're stupid, all right? <laughs> but treat us with respect. We are visual creatures. And we war and we fight to walk in purity. Those of us who are married, to have eyes for our wife and no one else, to be like 1 Timothy 3 says, a one woman man. But it would make it a lot easier if you would help your brothers out. And, and another little secret, godly men are turned off by immodest women. They might notice you, they might pay attention to you, they might look at you, but they will not marry you. Godly men are looking for a woman who can be beautiful, whether she's wearing an inch of makeup or none, whether she's wearing something immodest or a turtleneck with a sweater, praise Jesus, or whatever. <laughs> a true woman can look beautiful in anything. And godly men are drawn to a woman who treats her brothers with respect. And I simply speak in love. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I simply would encourage you, and I think some of you are simply naive. Um, would you please watch and care for your body and how you dress out of respect and out of godliness? Makes sense. Now, the marks of a godly woman. Man, we have a long ways to go. Forgive me. Now, point being simply, women, your focus should not be on waiting for the right person, but rather on being the right person. Are we tracking? Now, men, Isaac, I know we were running out of time. Men, are you guys doing okay? You awake? All right, here we go. Should we take a quick break? No? All right, your funeral. Okay, here we go. <laughs> men, notice the girls say no. Guys are like, yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> guys, Isaac, when you read the scriptures, you discover there are three things, not seven. Don't worry, you don't have to leave. It's okay, three, not seven, all right? They're harder, but shorter. Um, there are three things you discover about what a man looks like with his masculinity not defined by whether or not he's yoked and drinks protein shakes. Uh, but, um, I mean, no offense if you are yoked and drink protein shakes, but, um, uh, dude, you're hating me right now, sorry. Um, I'm just jealous. Uh, but with his masculinity, listen up, not defined by the world, but by the scriptures. There are three, three things true of a godly, masculine, Christ-like man, a warrior poet who's ready for marriage. He is a priest, he is a provider, and he is a what? He's a protector. Those of you who know the Bible, priest, provider, protector. Now let's read about Isaac as priest, provider, and protector because he's the man in the story. Um, first, he was a priest. And by priest, I simply mean spiritual leader. Look at uh, chapter 24, verse 63. We read, Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. Meaning after a long, hard day's work, he was out in the field praying. He was a man of prayer. Later on, we read in chapter 25, later on after he's married, we read in verse 21, Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. He was a man of prayer before he was married and after he was married. Men should be the priest in every relationship, every family, every home. They simply put, should be the spiritual leader. That doesn't mean we are the boss. It doesn't mean we are the dictator. It simply means we lead the way in passion for knowing God. A man should be the one saying, let's pray. A man should be the one saying, let's read the scriptures. Let's go to church. Let's seek God's face about this decision. A man and a woman, but a man should lead the way, lead the charge in seeking God's face. Later on, Paul says to Timothy, I desire that men should pray everywhere. Not simply in church, not just on the chorus of the song. Do, 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 verse, 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 chorus, chorus. Here we go, chorus. Uh, but I desire that men, <laughs> dumb, should pray everywhere. When you're singing, when you're talking, when you're in church, when you're outside in the park, when you're, men should pray everywhere. He says, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now, why men? I mean, why, sh why doesn't Paul say people should pray everywhere? I mean, should women pray everywhere as well? Yes. Why? Because men should lead the charge in public passionate pursuit of Jesus. 
Now, men, this doesn't mean you have to be the next pastor, the next Billy Graham, the next you know, Evan Wickham. It simply means you in your relationship, wherever you're at with Jesus, whether you walk with God for the last 30 years or 20 years or 20 days or 20 hours, you lead the charge. You are the one who says, you know what? Let's seek God. There's a fascinating and intriguing verse um, in Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. I'm gonna read to you super fast. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 35, Paul was talking about order in the church, and it was kind of a Jewish, chaotic, crazy, first century church in Corinth. And he says, if they, speaking of women, the, the, the girls, if they want to learn something, he's talking about the Bible, they want to learn about the Bible, about theology, and notice what he says, let them ask their own husbands, not the pastor, their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, the long, that verse is totally misunderstood and doesn't mean what most people think it means and we don't have time to talk about what it means. The point is, he simply, trust me, it's okay, God's not a sexist. Okay, the point is, he says, women should, when they're at church, ask their husbands what the Bible says, what theology says, what the text says. The implication is a man should know the answer, right? A woman should be able to ask you guys a question about the Bible, about theology, and you should be able to either answer right there on the spot, or, man, that's intimidating, that's hard, or you should know how to go back and say, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find out. You hold out, and can I let you know next Thursday night for dinner, or whatever. Um, I'm, I'm joking. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let you know, I'm gonna find out, which means, men, we need to know God's word. Am I right? Which is why Paul says also to Timothy, I'm gonna read you another verse. He says something beautiful in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. He says, be diligent to present yourself approved unto God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Notice he talks about Bible study and he uses the word worker, meaning understanding the scriptures, understanding the Bible is hard work, sweat, you roll up your sleeves. A preacher I, I know and love and respect would always put, he, put his boots on when he would write his teaching because he said writing a sermon was a man's work. <laughs> awesome. I do mine in my bathrobe. But um, he <laughs> put his boots on, right? Awesome. The point is knowing the scriptures is hard work. Now, some of you guys right now are single, and then this sounds intimidating, this sounds scary. It's not, okay? You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be a pastor. But but you want to be the kind of man, when you're married someday, um, or you're dating, or you're engaged, your, your wife or your gal can turn to you and ask you a question about the scriptures, and you know the answer, or you know how to go and discover the answer. You, know, you should take your years while you are single and not married and don't have the responsibility of kids and more. you should take your years and pour into knowing God's word and knowing the scriptures and read and memorize and podcast and listen to teaching after teaching after teaching and study and start a Bible study study and hang out with your guys and talk about God's word. I mean, whenever you have free time, devote your time to the study of the scriptures. Don't waste your time on TV or entertainment. No, rather invest your life as a man and your brain and the intellect God blessed you with. Study in the scriptures so that you can become the kind of man when you are married someday who knows God's word. And who doesn't have to say, what's the answer? I don't know. Go ask John Mark. No, ask you. You're a man. And God invites us as men to step up to the plate. It's not as scary as it sounds. And it's a long journey. I've been studying the Bible for the last 20 something years and I feel like I still don't have a clue. And every time I open the scriptures, I'm like, whoa, are you serious? Whoa, wow. I'm learning every day, absorbing information every single day. Guys, study, and this goes for gals too, but men, study to show yourself approved unto God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. Because it's kind of embarrassing, huh? Somebody's like, where's that verse? You're like, the Bible. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing. Paul says, you don't need to be ashamed. Be a man who knows the scriptures, who is a priest. You don't have to be the next Billy Graham. You don't have to be the next great, incredible, you know, celebrity for Jesus. Simply lead the way. You're the guy who says, you know what? Let's pray. You're the guy who says, you know what? This is God's decision, not ours. Let's pray. Let's read, you are the guy who studies the scriptures and knows what God has to say. Every man should be a priest. Isaac was a priest. Now second, he was a provider. Every man should be a provider. Plain and simple biblical truth, I could walk you from beginning to end. It's the man's responsibility to provide. Now, a couple of things about the man being the, oh, first let's read about Isaac. Um, we read in verse 67, then Isaac brought her, Rebekah, into his mother Sarah's tent. 
So the day he was married, he put a roof over her head. Not much, it was his dead mom's tent. Um, but he put a roof over her head. He's young. Don't expect your guy to be making six figures a year and rolling in the Rover, baby, or whatever. The de- Dude, he's 21, all right, relax. Um, but he was able, on the day of his wedding, to put a roof over his wife's head. Now, later on in chapter 26, we read in verse 12, then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper, continued prospering until he became very prosperous, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Ooh, he's the man. He's rich. Later on in life, he was a hardworking man with a vision for his career, um, cows, but whatever, a vision for his career. And later on in life, he became wealthy and affluent. But as a young man, he was dirt poor but he was able to put a roof over her head. Now, a couple of things about man being the provider. Um, one, I don't like the term provider. I prefer the term worker, but provider rhymes, or whatever, alliterates. Um, because God is our provider. Am I right, guys? It's God's job to provide, if you wanna be articulate. It's the man's job to work. Are we tracking? Men, we work hard. Work is a gift from God. We throw our back into every day but it's God's job to provide. We don't have to freak out. We don't have to worry. It's God's job to provide. Second, a man's responsibility from a biblical perspective, not cultural, but biblical perspective, is simply to provide a roof, food, and clothing. I'm talking on a financial level. Meaning you are not required by God to buy your wife a house in the West Hills and a Range Rover and a monthly credit card to Nordstrom, okay? Nothing wrong with those things but you are not required by God, maybe by culture, maybe by your girlfriend, but not by God, okay? You are simply required to work hard, trusting God, who is the ultimate provider, put a roof over your wife's head, clothes on your wife's back, new would be nice, but used is okay if she's into rock, and food in her stomach. Now three, number three, you have to decide as a man early on, as a young man, if possible, what kind of life on a financial, social level you desire to provide for your wife. And then when you meet somebody, you either have to hope she likes your idea or convince her or change. (laughs) But you have to decide early on, here's what I want. I wanna be rich, I wanna be poor, I wanna work my tail off, or I wanna work a a regular job and have time for my family, my sons, and not have the pressure of working. You have to decide, not a right or wrong decision, not a biblical issue, cultural. You have to decide for yourself, and you need to be clear on where you are going. Like I remember before I was married, when I was a young man, I had four goals. I knew that God called me to be a provider. I knew it was simply roof, food, and clothing on a financial level. I'm not talking on a marital level, but on a financial level. But I had four other goals. I wanted my wife to stay home. If we lived in a ghetto apartment out in wherever and ate beans and rice, I was devoted to my wife staying home after we had kids to raise my sons and my daughters. I don't want my kids growing up in daycare. I want my kids growing up with their mother, caring, shepherding, sculpting them in the ways of God. I wanted to own a home, not a biblical issue, but that was my desire to own a home someday and put a roof that we owned um, of a house, not an apartment, over my wife's head. I wanted to be able to give my wife money every month for clothes. I don't know why, but whatever was my goal. I wanted her to look good, feel comfortable, and take care of herself. And fourth, I wanted to be able to have money to take care of my kids. I wanted to be able to pay for braces when they're in high school. I wanted them to go to a good college. I never was blessed by that. My dad worked his tail off, but I wanted my kids to be able to go to a real good college someday. And uh, I wanted to be able to pay for piano lessons and stuff like that when they're little. Four goals. House in the West Hills was not one of them. Range Rover, dude, Range Rover is awesome, but was not one of them. Um, Stay at home mom, house, um, money for my wife to buy clothes every month, and some money for my kids. And by the grace of God, God's answer to the prayers. But I, I remember sitting down and saying, all right, here's where I wanna go. Now, how much money does it take to do that? In a city like Portland, we live in an expensive city. That's about fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year. So I knew, all right, at some point in time, I have to get to a place, not when I'm 21 or 22, but at some point in time down the road, I have to get to a place where I can make that much money in order to provide for my wife in this way. And then when you have, all right, here's where I'm going, then you start working toward it. 
So guys, this is not a biblical issue, this is not a moral issue, but it's a philosophical one. You have to decide what kind of lifestyle you wanna provide for your wife. You're simply called to provide for, it's very ambiguous in the scriptures. But you have to decide, nothing wrong with poverty. Jesus said, blessed are the poor. Nothing wrong with wealth. Isaac was a rich man, all right? But you have to decide what kind of lifestyle you wanna provide for your wife you have to do the math, meet with some people. All right, how much, how much money is it gonna cost to buy a home, to whatever, to live debt-free, to give her 100 bucks a month for clothes or whatever it takes? What's it gonna cost? And then you have to figure out, all right, what's a career that would get me there? What's a path I could walk down that would get me there? Uh, I love this, this could be great. I hate this, it would get me there, but I hate that, no way. And take your time, maybe it takes you a year, five years, 10 years, but sooner the better. And figure out, all right, here's where I'm trying to go. And what are the roads, what are the career paths that are going to get me there? And it's okay if it takes time. It's okay if you don't come out of the gate knowing, oh, I know exactly what I do wanna do and I'm gonna do this for the next two years. It's okay, some guys have that story, some guys have the dude, I have no clue what I'm doing story. But the point is, it's okay, it's okay. The point is to have a general goal. This is my goal, this is my vision, this is the kind of life I wanna provide for my wife someday, and then slowly but surely to begin to work toward that goal. And girls, don't expect your man to be there, unless if you wanna marry a dude who's 40, all right? Which is fine, it's Jewish, but whatever. Um, <laughs> but you need to be okay. Rebecca was in love with Isaac, and he was like, baby, my mother's tent. She's like, awesome, okay, but I love you, you know? She recognized he was a man on a path, on a journey, and she was willing to follow him, get behind him, and help him become who God was calling him to be. Are we tracking? He was a provider. Am I making sense, guys? All right? Now, third, protector. Protector. Every man is called by God to be his protector. It's why in our culture, we believe, um, not from the Bible, but because it's simply right, a man should open a door for a woman, Right? A dude should walk a girl out to his car when it's late at night and you're at the way and it's raining and it's dark and scary outside. Dudes, when you walk, you, not a weird, creepy kind of, you should walk a girl out to her car. Dead serious. When you, um, guys, when a woman is cold, you should say, here's my jacket. Not because you're hitting on her, not because you're, but simply because it's your job as a man to care for women. Um, when you are standing, guys, or you're sitting somewhere and you see a girl without a seat, you see a girl standing against the back wall, dude, you should jump out of your seat. You should say, here is my seat and my phone number, but whatever. Um, no, I'm joking. But whether you like her or not, whether you're flirting with her or not, whether you're, doesn't matter. You, a man's role is as protector and a woman should feel safe around her man, which is why I think, I know I'm gonna get in trouble here. I think every dude should do some things that are simply manly. Um, for example, now look at me, okay? Don't overreact, <laughs> all right? <laughs> I'm six foot two and I weigh 170 pounds. All right, don't over, and this is me working out. Can you imagine me not? Oh my gosh, all right. But um, for example, basketball. I think it's dumb, but every Monday afternoon I play basketball with my bros um, because, not because I like it, it's boring, but it's good for me. It's good for me to run into guys and, uh, and sweat and get out some testosterone and hit guys and oh yeah, well it's 4-3, it's not 5-3, huh, and whatever, you know? <laughs> Like, it's good for me to, to, to rough up, because I'm like, I like to read or whatever, you know what I mean? It's, it's good for me to get out. I, I'm not a big fan of sports. Uh, you guys who are, awesome, welcome. I, I think the idea of men getting paid, grown men getting paid millions of dollars to wear tights and bump into each other is dumb. Um, <laughs> But that's just me, I know I'm weird or whatever. But um, I find things that I like to do that are manly, that re I, I love to surf, I love to hike, I, I love to rock climb, and there's some things that I like to do that require energy and, brrr, and stuff like that, and I do them because they're good for me. Last night, we went up to Seattle to have dinner and, and buy this table, um, whatever, it's a long story, don't take time. Anyway, we show up to buy this table off Craigslist, beautiful table for dirt cheap, awesome deal. Anyway, so um, I have my, my Land Cruiser out and we, we put the back seat down and I go in to carry this table out and there's a dude there, right? So it's a married couple, man and a woman. Dude, did I say dude, my voice cracked? Anyway, there's a dude there and um, I like, I pay him the money, I'm like, all right, this is awesome, we're pumped, let's get the table. I get on one end, expecting him to get on the other man. He walks over to the door and he's like, let me get the door for you. I'm like, You're, okay, Tammy, can you help me carry the table? <laughs> so Tammy and I, my five foot tall, little petite, skinny, beautiful wife, carry out this table to my truck or whatever. We got in my truck, closed the door. I was like, babe, if I am ever an older dude, he wasn't even that old, and, and I don't carry the table, slap me in the face. 
all right? Seriously, I, I walked in, he was reading a book, and then he was nice, he opened the door for us. I was like, dude, when I'm like that age, I wanna be like doing push-ups or whatever, something on the ground, be like, let me get that table for you, ma'am, <laughs> right? Um, um, simply put, you guys who are jocks, just keep doing your thing. Those of us, like myself, who are more artsy or whatever, not really into wearing tights and bumping into each other, um, find something that you like Find something, I like hunting, awesome, hunt. I like riding motorcycles, me too, let's go, it's awesome. Find something that's manly and go out and do it. It's dead serious, it's good for your soul. Don't become an effeminate man. It's good for you to do something. It doesn't have to be, you know, NASCAR and beer. Uh, like, do something that you like. It can be sophisticated. It can be indie rock. It can be your fixed gear bicycle, whatever. Josiah, where are you? Josiah, for example. Artsy, east side, guitar playing, Josiah, where are you, man? He, I think he's in the video venue. He rides his fixed gear bicycle this time of year from Hawthorne Boulevard in southeast to the way every Friday night. He was hit by a car last week. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, look for the guy. He walked in tonight and was like, do you guys have a wheelchair? <laughs> Like, no, but he has an awesome, like, cane and, uh, like, a big, you know, thing or whatever. He's, like, like, scars on his face. He's manly. Now, he doesn't play a football, but I'm like, dude, you ride a fixed gear from southeast Portland. You got hit by a car. You are so tough. Yeah. All right. Guys, do, find something that works for you, but do something that keeps you strong, that keeps you healthy, that keeps you active. Um, and that keeps you a healthy, godly, masculine, not defined by NASCAR, monster truck, monster truck rallies, and bodybuilding, but defined by God. David was a warrior and a poet. Nothing wrong with being a poet and writing music and writing poetry, as long as you can also knock out Goliath's front teeth. Makes sense. Warrior poet. Now, here's what I have to have you understand before we leave. I'm almost done. You're like, yeah, right. <laughs> Isaac, in the story, was a total failure as a protector. Read chapter 26, verse six. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar, and the men of the place asked about his wife. He said, she is my sister, for he was afraid to say she is my wife, because he thought, lest the men of the place kill me for Rebekah, because she is beautiful to behold. Now it came to pass, when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and, and there was Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. Um, you know what that means. Then Abimelech called, I, it doesn't mean they were hugging, by the way. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, quite obviously she is your wife. How could you say she's my sister? Uh, Isaac said to him, because I said, lest I die on account of her. Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of the people might have soon lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt on us. Man, he was an absolute failure as a protector. He's in a foreign land, he's scared he's going to get killed because his wife is super hot, she's super beautiful, she's super awesome. So he's like, uh, she's my sister, really. Uh, so he puts his poor wife, who was a godly woman, at risk of being raped by another man because he was scared of, of his people. Now, before we mock Isaac for being a total failure and make fun of him for being a wuss and he was scared, Okay, notice what happens next. God does not berate him. Look at 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. God showed him grace, and Rebecca, we read later on, showed him grace. He was an absolute failure. Priest, awesome. Spiritual leader, yep, leading the way. Love for God, yep, he was success. Uh, provider, yep, working hard, poor when he was young, but working toward wealth and affluence and providing for his wife, awesome, absolute success. Uh, protector, nope, wuss, total failure. But here's what you have to understand. Those of you who know the story of Genesis, who know the biblical narrative, he was following in his father's footsteps. His dad, Abraham, who was a great man, a man of faith, made the exact same mistake, not once, but how many times? Twice! Uh, Sarah, she's my sister. You idiot, what's wrong? I mean, you think like you would learn your lesson the first time, don't call your wife sister and let her risk being raped, but no, twice in the same lifetime with the same wife. 
Isaac was a result of his father's brokenness. The pain, the dysfunction, uh, the brokenness in his dad's life was passed on into his life. He was a result of his father's brokenness, and he was a success as a priest, a success as a provider, but an absolute failure as a protector. But God showed him grace, and Rebecca showed him grace. We are a broken generation. You guys know that. We are the product of divorce and sexual immorality and MTV and the 60s and the 80s and the reversal of male and female gender roles. We are, our culture is a train wreck. The entire deal is upside down. The divorce rate is through the roof. People are unhappy. I mean, unfaithfulness is insane. I mean, our culture is screwed up to the core and we are a product of our parents' generation, our parents' brokenness, and we bear the marks. Now, I'm a blessed man. I was raised with an incredible dad. It's right back there, my dad, my dad, Phil Comer. You guys know him. He was an incredible example to me of godliness. I remember him sitting me down when I was like 10 years old. Jamark, where are you going to go to college? Like, I just want to play G.I. Joe, you know? <laughs> like, how are you going to provide for your wife? Where, I mean, he was an awesome dad pushing me toward being a priest and a provider and a protector at a young age. Jamark, you should play basketball, but I like piano. Jamark, outside, now, in the mud. Here's the ball. Go, right? He was a great dad, but I recognized uh, I'm a rarity, and I recognized the majority of you grew up fatherless men, um, without a dad, without somebody you can look at and say, that's what a godly man looks like. That's what true masculinity looks like. That's what a warrior poet looks like. That's what a gentle giant looks like. If all you have is Matthew McConaughey, you're done for, right? And I know some of you don't have a role model, a godly man, a godly father. I know some of you bear the scar, men and women, but in particular men, we are a fatherless generation, in particular. You bear the scars of not having a dad, you bear, or having a dad, but a dysfunctional one at best, or a weird family, or a divorce, or yeah, having a dad, but not present, not around, or not walking with God, or whatever, you fill in the blank. And I recognize generational sins are passed on and the brokenness in your father's life might reemerge in your life. But Isaac was 100% improvement from his dad. His dad twice, Isaac once. He's moving in the right direction. By his next son, Jacob, he's not calling his wife his sister. Now he had two wives, different problem. But, um, <laughs> but the point is they were growing, they were maturing in Christ. God showed him grace. She showed him grace. Girls, show your men grace. Show our generation grace. Nobody's perfect. And listen up, boys and girls, men and women, if you are looking for the perfect spouse, you are going to spend the rest of your life waiting. You're gonna end up an old single dude or a not married woman. Nobody is perfect. I'm not saying set the bar low. I'm not saying marry anybody, he breathes, you know. Not, no. I'm saying we need to show one another grace. Maybe it will take our generation an extra 10 years to grow up. But with Christ's help, we as men will grow up. And we will, by Christ's help in time, by his spirit, become priests and providers and protectors. We might fail along the way, but men, I'm with you to the end. And I plan on sitting in the same garage and spending time with you same men 20 years from now. Some of you are gonna look good. Some of you, not, all right? Take the UI thigh vow, all right? <laughs> but I plan on sitting here in the same garage with you men and saying the same thing. And me pressing you on and you pressing me on, let's become godly men. Let's become a warrior poet. Let's become a true man of God. Show each other grace. It's going to take us some time. It's going to take us a while as a community, as a generation, as a people to find our footing and stumble. But God is transforming us day by day into the image of Christ. Show one another grace because you have to understand, and I'm done now, you will marry someone who is a reflection of yourself. By that I mean, um, if you don't love Jesus, don't expect to marry someone who does. If you don't have a passion to know God, don't expect to marry someone who does. 
If you don't know the scriptures, don't expect marry to, some, to marry someone who does. If you don't care for your body, don't expect to marry someone who does. If you don't value marriage and family, don't expect to marry someone who does. You marry, for the most part, as a general rule, not universal law, but general rule, you marry someone in our culture who is a reflection of yourself, of where you are at, which means the question is not, who is she? Is, who is she? He. It's not about finding the right person. It's not about waiting for the right person. It's about becoming the right person by Christ's word and his spirit. Are we tracking? The question is not who is he or who is she or where. The question is who am I? Amen? Amen. Let's pray.